everyone! Welcome to my talk on the facial animation pipeline for Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm Simon Habib, a lead technical animator at IDOS Montreal. A bit about me. I started the first 10 years of my career as a rigging artist, which gave me a solid foundation for tool development, um, um, for tool development, human anatomy, automation, and improving the user experience. In more recent years, I dedicated my time and attention to my true passion, which is facial animation. Since action-adventure narrative games are my favorite genre to play, working on this project was a perfect match, and allowed me to create genuine and emotional performances. Based on the incredible feedback that our game has received, I'm proud to say that our characters have resonated with players. To kick things off, I'd like to present you this 30-second clip from one of our cinematics, showing different stages of production. Throughout this presentation, we'll see how this scene was created. You say you have all of this energy. Faith energy. Right, but when we first saw you, weren't you stranded on Hallis Hope because your shuttle ran out of juice? Yes, I was, but... So why don't you just believe that your ship had more gas? It doesn't work that way. Faith energy is a byproduct of belief. Focused belief. <laughs> okay, sure. I saw this proven. To kick things off, oh, sorry, <laughs> here are the topics we'll be covering in this presentation. We'll begin by talking about the vision, our goals and expectations at the start of the project. Next, we'll talk about the photogrammetry scan. This is the process in which we take images of a model in order to get anatomically correct characters. In the third section, we'll explore the three types of performance capture that we used in our game. In the fourth section, we'll talk about how we pro processed all the data from these capture sessions and converted them into animations. In the fifth section, we'll talk about the cinematic polish and how we brought these animations to final quality. And finally, if we have time, we'll end with a Q&A. So I'd invite you to write down questions in a notepad or in the chat, and I'll do my best to answer them at the end. Uh, if we run out of time, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn, and I'd be glad to chat about any of this. I, I want to mention that this is a facial animation-centric talk, so I won't be covering everything about the cinematic pipeline or facial rigging. It's really about how we capture our actors and how we animate our characters. I may get into some technical concepts, but it's still meant to be an overview of the pipeline. So the vision, what did we set out to do when we started this project? We knew that the Guardians of the Galaxy was going to be a performance-driven narrative game. Since it's the Guardians, uh, we knew that there would be an ensemble cast of five characters and that they'd be together for most of the game. We knew that these characters were going to be stylized to look more like their comic book counterparts, but they had to be very believable. We wanted a lot of emotion to come through these characters. We also knew that they'd be traveling to different planets, so there would be non-human characters as well. We wanted to push what is done in our industry. We wanted to look at different technical innovations that we could incorporate into our game. One of those is photogrammetry. Typically on games, we would have a team of character artists sculpting and using reference images to create their characters. Whereas with photogrammetry, we get the precision of scanning an actual person as the basis of our characters. We'll talk a bit more about that in the next section. In terms of audio versus video based animations, a lot of games use audio tracks to generate facial animations, and while that may give very accurate lip sync, it kind of has to approximate what to do with the rest of the face, which is usually procedurally generated using emotion tags. When working with video-based animations, an actor's performance is our source and is directly translated onto our characters, so we get more believable performances and subtlety. We were fortunate to have our own in-house mocap stage, and we were planning to use it extensively on this project. Our cast was comprised primarily of local actors, which meant the turnaround from booking our sessions, capturing all our data, and then generating usable animations was very, very short, especially if we were to compare that with working with an external mocap studio. Let's talk about the advantages of full performance capture. Many game developers tend to record their voice separate from their body mocap and facial capture, and then stitch all that data together for their cinematics, which doesn't always guarantee that they'll all line up and give a cohesive performance. In contrast, when we're, when we're working with our actors, their voices, their faces, and their bodies are all recorded at the same time, which ensures that the performance is as accurate and natural as possible. 
In video games, we often hear that we have to either choose quantity or quality, meaning we either have lots of animations or fewer at a much higher quality. On this project, we tried to prove that it would be possible to offer quantity and quality by having multiple tiers of quality of facial animation. Bronze being mostly automated with little to no manual labor. Silver is the one that comes the closest to the actual performance, but requires a manual polish pass. And then gold is really that final touch at the end that is reserved for the most important shots. The first topic we're going to look at is photogrammetry scanning. This is the process of taking hundreds of images of a subject from many different angles to build a 3D model. Given that our game is stylized, our characters didn't need to be one-to-one -one with the performers, so we had to make the decision. Do we want to start by casting a model and then designing a concept art based on that person or vice versa? In our game, we decided we were going to design the concept art first and then cast a model to best fit that character. This photogrammetry room was designed by Pixel Light Effects and assembled in our own studio. The room itself is composed of 40 DSLR cameras and five softbox lights, which would all get triggered at the same time. The lights ensured that we have a nice diffuse lighting with hardly any shadow shadows across the face. In total, we had 13 scan sessions, so 13 different models that came in for different characters. When each model would come in, we would dot their faces with roughly 100 facial, facial markers using an eyeliner, which allowed the character artists to accurately track the deformation and skin sliding. In the booth, we would ask the models to hold about 25 different facial expressions, and these full face expressions is what we use to separate into 138 blend shapes for our facial rigs. Let's quickly go over the workflow. These cameras would give us CR2 raw image files that we would pass into Lightroom Classic for some color balance and light adjustments. Bringing these edited pictures into Reality Capture gave us a point cloud and generated very high-res meshes. We were able to automate this process, making it much quicker, especially considering the number of expressions for each model that would come in. Then, we would hand off these high-res meshes to the character artist team, who would bring them into Wrap 3, apply them onto our base mesh, and then bring them into ZBrush for cleanup, stylization, and final polish. Over here, we have a preview in Maya of those blend shapes kind of blending in from one another. Uh, the goal for this first test was to try to get our digital character as close to a perfect match with our real-life model before the stylization phase. The advantage of applying these blend shapes to a base mesh is that we could mix and match different parts of multiple characters with one another in order to, to create brand new characters. In the upper right corner, we can see a sample of different expressions taken from a single camera. And beneath it, we have an expression sheet of those expressions converted as blend shapes. Next, we'll talk about performance capture. From our in-house motion capture set, our actors' body motion, facial performances, and voices are recorded simultaneously. There are three types of performance capture that we used on this project, and we'll explore each of them. In the bottom picture, we can see the mocap volume that we used uh, for all of our cinematics. Even though it's a relatively small volume in comparison to other studios, it was great for conversations, some simple locomotion, and even some stunts. At most, we had seven actors recorded at the same time, of which six were wearing head-mounted head cameras used for facial performance capture, which was the maximum that we actually had available on set. Uh, the body mocap was recorded via OptiTrack, and the helmet cams were provided by Facewear. In the picture on the right, we can see our cast all geared up in their suits and helmet cameras, but you may notice that their, each actor has their own live microphone attached to the front of their helmets, which allowed us to record their audio tracks individually and then combine them into a single file whenever we needed. When capturing the body mocap for all of these actors, with the facial footage, with the microphones, and three reference cameras placed around the room, all of this data needed to be synced, so we would use a common timecode across all of them. We also needed to, tr to trigger the recording of all these devices at the same time. Uh, and we also had to name all of our files consistently. So we had an in-house solution called Lumière. From the bottom image, we can see the monitors with the facial performance videos being streamed in real time. On a typical shoot, we would have about five people supervising the session from this angle. Um, we had our producer, our cinematic director, our mocap specialist, 
uh, our audio engineer and myself, the facial tech. Um, we also had a team who would help us suit up the actors whenever they, in the morning whenever they came in. Uh, a lot of this was under normal conditions, but of course our last year of produ production was not under normal conditions. We had restrictive measures to follow and a strict protocol with social distancing, masks, visors, hand sanitizers, and all that. But what was most interesting is that we had a camera recording the entire room that we could stream via Zoom so that certain people could actually monitor our shoots from home and provide feedback through Slack. We had to make do with the situation, but we pulled it off and managed to complete all the recordings that we had left to do. On this slide, we have a closer look at the helmet cams that, were used, that we were using. This is the Mark III model of FaceRoy's head-mounted camera, or HMC for short. Uh, even though they recently released the Mark IV model, we were using the Mark III during production. These cameras uh, record in RGB, so color footage at 720p, 60 frames per second. Beneath the camera, there's a dimmable LED light, which helps to reduce harsh background lights and minimize shadows. Uh, regarding the calibration, we would draw tiny dots across the actor's face, 27 to be exact, that match the same tracking landmarks in the software that we used for, uh, to track the facial footage. On the monitors that we saw in the previous slide, we could display a grid overlay to adjust the framing of each actor's helmet and to make sure that the face was nicely centered in that vertical video. This was useful for ensuring consistency throughout the day and between shoots. We would also adjust the lens's focus to make sure our pixels were as sharp as possible for the tracking process. Uh, it's also really important to mention the comfort of the actors. Fortunately, these helmets are pretty lightweight compared to other models. While the camera and the lights are placed in front of the actor's face, they're just low enough that it doesn't occlude their vision. We always have to keep in mind that we don't want to hinder their performance. Over here, we'll see the performance capture footage for the same cinematic that we saw earlier at the beginning of the presentation. On the right, we have the six HMC videos. In the center, we have the three reference camera videos. And in the bottom, we have the take name and the time code, which allows us to sync all the media files, including those individual audio tracks that are all combined to create a single, uh, single audio file for this video. You say you have all of the- Sorry about that. This energy. Faith energy. Right, but when we first saw you, weren't you stranded on Hallow's Hope because your shuttle ran out of juice? Yes, I was, but... So why didn't you just believe that your ship had more gas? It doesn't work that way. Faith energy is a byproduct of belief. Focused belief. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> I saw this proven. These tiled videos are assembled by an automation script using FFmpeg commands and are crucial for our editing process. Our cinematic director would use these to identify the selected takes and stitch them together to create a first pass edit. Another type of performance capture is what we call banter sessions. We knew that our Guardians of the Galaxy were going to be talking throughout the entire game, so not just in cinematics, but also throughout gameplay. Typically, these types of recording sessions are done with a single actor in an audio booth, recording their lines one after another, without necessarily having any castmates to interact with. For our game, we had the advantage of recording all of our actors together in one space, which allowed them to maintain their chemistry and ensure that dialogues felt a lot more genuine and dynamic. In total, we recorded 23,000 lines of dialogue, and for every one of them, the actors were wearing an HMC. The videos of these performances were used to generate facial animations for our locomotion, our combat, and in-game conversations. By referring to the time code metadata embedded in our audio tracks, we could identify the start time and the duration of each clip so that we could clip the corresponding HMC video. Even though we were tracking the entire face, we were using primarily the lower part for the lip sync. The full face data was passed on to a machine learning process that would give us an emotion track which we'll talk about a bit later. In this video, we have a clip from a banter session. In this example, the actors are standing still while they read their lines from a tablet. Typically, when recording with a stationary or suspended microphone, actors are required to direct their voice, which limits their movements. Since our microphones are attached to their helmets, the actors were free to move around as much as they wanted during the recording sessions without causing gain issues or distortion in the audio. This carnage brings back troubling memories of worlds I destroyed. 
Always wondered, what did you use to do that? Some kind of mega bombs? Rocket. Blades. My own hands. And feet. Knees. Elbows. Often my forehead. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> it's 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 terrifying. <laughs> oh, it's so good. I chose this clip because it also shows a bit of the levity between, among our performers. Between takes, uh, they were often laughing and cracking jokes. Um, and so considering how long some of these sessions can be, it was really nice to see that they were still enjoying the writing that was given to them and always maintaining that chemistry. The third and last type of performance capture that we used is the emotion capture. Uh, during these sessions, we would ask the actors to perform a range of different emotions at varying degrees of intensity. The emotions that we had narrowed down were content, angry, nervous, and sad. The theory behind this is that when we speak with different emotions, we have a lot of nonverbal gestures, both as a speaker and as a listener. With that in mind, we paired the actors one-on-one, -on -one, and we had them both standing and seated, which offered a wide range of different body gestures that we could add as a layer on top of locomotions. As I mentioned earlier, the facial performance recorded during the banter session could be passed to a machine learning process to generate an emotion track, and this would determine an actor's emotional state and intensity. These values would fetch the corresponding animation from our library and drive the upper portion of the face as well as body gestures. If you'd like to learn more about this, I recommend that you check out tomorrow's session called Emotion Detection for Expressive Characters in Guardians of the Galaxy by Romain Trachel, which is part of the Machine Learning Summit. In this video, we have an example of in-game banters. You'll notice that the lip sync matches the performance and the body has overlaid animation. You'll also notice that there's automated directional lookouts for the eyes, the head, and the torso. So depending on who is talking, they would look at each other. Keep in mind that this is auto-generated, so we consider this a bronze performance. It would be easier to throw the rodent. No, it would not. What if he breaks a leg? He would still have three. No one's throwing rocket. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Just leave it. What's your problem? My problem is Meathead trying to huck me over a cliff. You are overreacting. I did not throw you. Only because Quill stopped you. And there should be no problem. I'm watching you, you Katafian psychopath. Uh, imagine that they could be walking or running through the environment, and these animations would be layered on top of locomotion. But for the sake of this clip, the characters are standing still. I picked this clip also to demonstrate how our facial performance translates quite well onto a non-human character like Rocket. After we've captured all this data from these three types of performance capture sessions, how do we convert them all into animation? So, batch processing. It's the ability to run through thousands of videos, automatically track actors' facial performances, and apply first-pass animations to their respective character rigs. To be able to batch the tracking of our performance videos and generate facial animations, we have to train the software to understand how each actor's face moves slightly different from one another. We often use the term profiles to describe the binding of our real-life actor and their respective digital character. On the right, we see two screenshots of Faceware Analyzer, the facial, tra facial tracking software that we use. As part of this training process, we build a tracking model, which is a collection of all the different expressions and mouth shapes that we have throughout our timeline. I wrote less is more in the sense that we want to identify our peak expressions, also known as training frames, avoid too many redundancies, and let the software do the interpolation between them. Consistency is key in the sense that if we introduce too many contradictions between similar expressions, the software doesn't really know how to deal with them, and that could result in shaky tracking. After we finished our tracking model, we repeat a similar process in Facer Retargeter, which we were using in Maya, to build out a pose library of corresponding facial expressions on our digital character. <laughs> that library... Hold on a sec. Uh, that library can contain a lot of extremes, but we also wanted to include subtle expressions to really have a nice range. We decided that we would keep a bit of asymmetry in order to get the timing from what the actors were doing. In total, we had facial profiles for 20 characters on our project. One way to efficiently build a face profile is to record a facial ROM, which is short for range of motion. 
In this video, I've chosen different parts of a typical ROM and edited down to about a minute. These videos usually take about five minutes to record. We focus on different face groups, so we'll start by isolating the eyes, the brows, and then the mouth. And then we end with a mix of different emotions and lines to test the range of our profiles. Eyes looking forward, wide forward, now wide up, down, left, right. One wide rotation, just be clockwise fast, yeah, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Skewed left, mm -hmm. skewed right. Mm -hmm. I. 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 E. 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 U. 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 O. 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 Uh, smile with closed lips. Mm -hmm. Extreme. Skewed left, like a smirk left. Mm -hmm. Smirk right. Close sneer. Scrunch up the nose. Close. Now show teeth. The human torch was denied a bank loan. <laughs> the human the torch was denied, was denied a bank, bank loan! loan. While the purpose of a facial ROM is mostly for building out our character profiles, we found out that it had a lot of other benefits as well. It served as a really good vocal warm-up for the actors at the beginning of the day. It was good for adjusting audio levels and for testing the, the recording trigger across our multiple devices, including that embedded timecode. For those reasons, we would do it every session, even if we weren't necessarily using the footage to create new profiles. Some characters were actually able to benefit from the same one facial ROM that we had set up early in the project, and we never really had to create another. ROMs were still necessary whenever we had a new actor joining the cast, so that we could create a profile for them and pair them to their digital character. These are the tools that we used for batching, um, but I'm noticing we're running a bit short on time, so I listed here the, different, the, the inputs that we normally provide to the batch in order to generate bronze animations. Um, if you have any questions about this, please send them to me and, um, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer you, but otherwise eh, we'll move on to the next one. After batching all this data and generating our bronze animations, we can move on to the cinematic polish. This is a technical and artistic polish pass on top of existing animations to obtain the highest fidelity and most believable animations. Over here we have the team of motion artists. In our team of four, we were part of the cinematic department. One of our team's responsibilities was handling the body mocap, which included suiting up the actors when they would come in, as well as setting up the actors' body profiles in Motion Builder. Then we would clean up the data and retarget, retarget it onto their respective body rigs. Regarding faces, our team was in charge of setting up the facewear profiles based on the ROMs that would allow us to batch process all those bronze animations for in-game and for cinematics. We also took care of the silver facial pass, uh, which I broke down here into two steps. The technical pass, which our goal was to try to match the performance as closely to what the actors did. Accuracy and capturing subtlety were really the priority here. There's also tongue animation. Since Facial doesn't provide tongue tracking, this was keyframed for specific close-ups when needed. Then there's also what we call the artistic pass, where we can actually go beyond what the perform performers did. So we can emphasize certain expressions, we can hold expressions for comedic timing, and it's also an opportunity to accentuate the asymmetry that the batch process gave us. In this video, we'll see a comparison between bronze and silver. So on screen left, we have a version that was automatically generated, meaning no manual polish. And on the right, we have a silver quality facial animation, which has both uh, a technical and an artistic pass. This was captured in Maya, so not in our game engine, which is why some of the shaders may appear a bit different. Oh! <sighs> Please proceed. Ah, you go ahead. No need, I insist. No, I insist. Please, proceed. This pointless pageant of politeness plagues our progress. Which is why you should go first. Very well. I will voyage through the vexing vestibule. <laughs> Over here is another example of what we did in the motion artist team. We generally work in a standalone scene with just a single character and no body animation and no set. This was meant to give us the maximum frame rate and no distractions. You may notice the colored sphere in the bottom left corner. This was meant to help us identify the frames in which we have close-ups, medium shots, or if the character was off camera. This allowed us to focus the polish time on the moments that really mattered. 
Uh, this is actually this, the facial animation scene for the same sequence that we saw at the very beginning. So the conversation between Starlord and Raker. You say you have all of this energy. Faith energy. Right, but when we first saw you, weren't you stranded on Halos Hope because your shuttle ran out of juice? Yes, I was, but... So why don't you just believe that your ship had more gas? It doesn't work that way. Faith energy is a byproduct of belief. Focused belief. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> I saw this proven. After the motion artists have completed their work with the body mocap data as well as the silver facial animation, we would hand this off to the cinematic animators. Part of their job was to assemble all the scenes and bring the animations to final quality. That includes the many different characters, props, vehicles, cinematic cameras, and environments. They would also animate the hands for all of our characters, since the, that wasn't part of our performance capture. Aside from humanoid characters, they would also animate animals and creatures that didn't have mocap data or facial animation. In the images here, we have the example of Cosmo the dog. While his voice was provided by an actor, we didn't capture an actual dog's face. We did, however, ca capture the body motion of two dogs for several of his scenes. Another task was the head and look at adjustments, since a lot of the characters don't have the same proportions as their characters. The best example is Rocket, where his actor was almost the same height as Star-Lord's, but the character of Rocket is much shorter. Specific to character faces, our cinematic animators would bring some of our facial animations to a gold quality level for specific emotional beats and for marketing shots. It was up to them to give that final beauty pass. They also had the advantage of animating to the camera as opposed to the motion artists who worked in standalone scenes. Even though we had those colored orbs to know the proximity of the camera, the cinematic animators were able to polish the faces directly in the scene. So we're almost at the end of the presentation. I want to go over some takeaways from this production. I believe we delivered on our promise of shipping with quality and quantity. We had 13 scan sessions, so 13 models that came in as the basis for our characters, providing anatomically correct blend shapes. We created 20 unique facework profiles that could be used for batch processing. For the in-game dialogue, including combat, conversations, and locomotion, we had 23 lines of dialogue. Uh, almost all of those were bronze animations. I didn't put 100% because some required some manual adjustments, but we were very close. Uh, and then for cinematics, we had a bit over five hours of cinematic content, which includes the multiple branching paths in our story. The ratio between gold and silver was about 90% silver, 10% gold. Quickly looking to the future, how can we improve all of this? I look forward to improving the overall quality of the animations that we generate from our performance uh, capture sessions. For example, polishing them directly in the scenes with the cinematic cameras. I also look forward to maybe higher realism, but that's usually dictated by the art direction of the project. It would be nice to see how far we can push our photogrammetry scans in combination with performance capture. And then finally, there's uh, previewing our animations in engine with proper lighting and shaders to try to get a faster turnaround than just rendering in Maya. Uh, to wrap up, I would like to present to you this 40 se 45 second clip of a gold sequence that incorporates almost everything that we saw in this presentation. So enjoy. Gamora, wait, hold on a sec. Why? So more children can be sacrificed in the name of Raker's flagged up church? Of course not, just... Just what, Peter? If you had just let me finish this on the temple ship, we wouldn't be here. They wouldn't be here. I know Raker brings back bad memories. This isn't about Thanos. It's about Nikki and what men like Raker and Thanos do to girls like her. Like me, my sister. If I had just been better at protecting Nebula, maybe... Maybe she wouldn't be dead. Whoa. What? Nebula's dead? How? By who? Tell me, so I can find him and shake his attack in hand. <laughs> so it's kind of a heavy scene, but I'll leave you with that. And um, I don't think we have a lot of time for Q&A, so if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to answer. You can find me at SimonEyes23 on most social platforms. Otherwise, find me on LinkedIn. And uh, I'll try to organize maybe a post uh, GDC talk hangout. Um, I have a Zoom link. I'm not sure how I'm going to manage to send it to everyone. Maybe put it in the chat. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.